There's some things that we know to be true beyond a shadow of a doubt. And this is what we know is true. Jesus is coming again. But what all does it mean when we say Jesus is coming again? What do we mean by that? Uh, oftentimes we're referring to the rapture uh, when we're looking forward to Jesus coming to the clouds and calling us up to be with him. And uh, of course that is something we know to be true. And it's a wonderful thing we're looking forward to. But ultimately the return of Jesus is found on the Mount of Olives. And we're going to look in Zechariah chapters 12 and 14 today. If you want to go ahead and turn there. And we're going to see the returning house of David. Now, we do know Jesus is uh, of the lineage of David, and that uh, comes down through Joseph, his supposed dad, and, uh, or earthly father, I might say it that way instead. Uh, but yet he was born of a virgin. And so the lineage really goes through Mary up through Nathan, uh, which is the son of David, and not, not through Solomon, which is the son of David, though by right of adoption, he, he would have the right to the throne of Israel. And by uh, right of the virgin birth, he has right to the throne of Israel because uh, Jeconiah is not allowed to sit on that and uh, throne. Uh, but Jesus is allowed to sit on the throne, and right now he's on the right hand of the Father, waiting to his enemies be made his footstool, and then he is coming again. Now with this return of Jesus to the Mount of Olives, there are some wonderful promises concerning the new heaven and new earth, the millennial reign, so many different things we think about, but one of the great promises is to his people Israel, the apple of his eye, and even today I submit that uh, the blessings of Israel are still in effect just like the blessings were during the time of Abraham. Those who are a blessing to the people of Israel, God will bless. Those who are cursed to the people of Israel, God will curse. Uh, so we want to operate in that manner today. And again, I've mentioned this several times in the past few weeks. Uh, if Israel, having rejected the Lord as their Savior, that is national Israel, I'll say not all Jewish people have rejected Jesus. Many have come to know Jesus as their Savior. Uh, but as a whole, they've rejected Jesus. And because of that, uh, Paul went to the Gentiles. But Paul made this statement. He said, uh, well, if they rejected Jesus and Gentiles are blessed, how much more so when they receive Jesus as Messiah? And that's what we're looking forward to. I cannot uh, begin to fathom what it will be like with Jesus reigning on this earth for a thousand years and then on the new heaven and new earth for time will be no more. So we really can't say for thousands and billions of years because uh, time will uh, just simply be no more. For eternity is the right way to say it. And uh, mathematically, that means without boundaries. And so time will not be a boundary whatsoever. Uh, so we look forward to those things. And if, and, and if we... Enjoy the blessings of God today. How much more when the people of Israel as a nation uh, serve the Lord? And we do know as a, as a uh, just a pre-thought before we get any further, uh, several years ago, had a fella, uh, well, word came to me. Uh, he said, well, he's Jewish and he's, he's just saved because he's Jewish. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. The Bible does teach that only redeemed Israel will enjoy in the fulfillment of these promises. So those of, of Israel who reject Jesus as Messiah, they don't get it. Those of Israel who have received Jesus as Messiah, uh, they will get to receive it. So be clear. As Paul said in Romans chapter 13, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that sentence, that verse, is in reference to there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And therefore, we must all come to him in repentance of sin and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ if we want to have uh, salvation. If we want to be rescued from the from our sins, from the wages of sin, death, and eternity in hell, and instead have the grace of God. And we're going to look at a little touch of the grace of God upon the people of Israel today. But I want to actually begin, even though our texts are in Zechariah chapter 12 and 14, I want us to begin in Matthew chapter 23. 
In Matthew chapter 23, this is just before uh, Jesus, well, in chapter 24 and 25, a lot of prophecy there, uh, but just before Jesus uh, goes to the cross, uh, he says this, and he's addressing the multitudes and his disciples. He's he's addressing the Pharisees and, and to be weary of them, woe unto you uh, Pharisees, hypocrites, he says, oftentimes scribes and Pharisees. And in verse 37, he makes this statement, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, thou that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Now I'm just going to pause there and throw this in. It's free. Uh, actually, everything that I do is free because I'm indebted to the Lord so much. Uh, but this is free. <laughs> this is free part of the message. Uh, notice what the Lord says. He said, I would have gathered you, but you would not. You see, there is a choice. He created us with free will. Uh, but nevertheless, in verse 38, he goes on to say, as a result of verse 37, Behold, your house is left desolate. It's left unto you desolate. In verse 39, he says, For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now, oftentimes when we look at fulfilled prophecy, we look at the Old Testament, see it fulfilled in the, in the New, uh, but we're kind of going backwards here. We're looking at the New Testament, and we are going to go back to the Old Testament to see when Zechariah says that that will be fulfilled. When Jesus said, until you call me blessed, you will not see me again. Well, Zechariah tells us when that will happen. Now let's get over to uh, Zechariah chapter 12 and chapter uh, 14. In chapter 12, we see the return of the house of David. And we'll read through these things uh, instead of reading it all at one time. But let's go to the Lord in prayer before we continue on. Dear Lord, we come to you now and I thank you so much for our Savior Jesus. Thank you that he is uh, the risen Savior and the Savior who's alive and well today on our right hand, and he's coming again in might and power, the rapture. Yes, Lord, but Lord, today we're going to look at his uh, second coming where he sets his feet on this earth in particular. We know that will be at the Mount of Olives, uh, according to Acts and also Zechariah. And so, Lord, we thank you for these uh, prophecies, and I thank you that your prophecies are specific, uh, not spread out and vague, but uh, specific. Now, we don't always know all things. Well, you know all things, uh, but Lord, we know uh, more and more as the time progresses, we can see, oh yes, how these things can come about. And Lord, I do believe Jesus is coming soon, but I know that you're gracious and long-suffering. And Lord, for my sake, send Jesus now. Uh, but we thank you. For we were at one time under the long-suffering of God until we came to repentance. And so for those who are lost, Lord, we do thank you for your long-suffering. We pray for that. Uh, but for those of us who are saved, uh, just looking towards our, our salvation and rescue, send Jesus now. And Lord, in this message today, uh, give us hope. And Lord, you know I'm recording this early, and if you've called us out before this message hits, hits the internet, uh, Lord, bless it for those who are left behind that they might repent before it's too late. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, first off, let's look at the return of the house of David in Zechariah chapter 7, or rather chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. And first off, we see the tents of Judah. Now, notice what the Lord says here as we begin in verse 7. It says, The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And so we see that uh, in this coming of the Lord, 
uh, the people of Israel. And he says, during this day, all the people of Israel will be like the house of David. Now, when we think about David, we go back in time past in the, in the Kings and in the Chronicles and uh, in Samuel as well, the books of Samuels. And, and, and Lord, we see the uh, King David and all that he did and how his heart was, uh, I, I love this phrase, hot after God. I believe I read that in a J. Vernon uh, McGee book and, and he referred that to uh, Roscoe P. Coltrane when he was in hot pursuit of the Dukes. Well, uh, uh, we should be in hot pursuit of the Lord like David was. And David was a man after God's own heart. And uh, we do know that he was a, a sinful man, but uh, but yet he was a forgiven man. And he was a man to be uh, admired in all those other aspects of his life. And uh, somebody that we should use as a guidepost uh, to live as David lived for the Lord. And, and what do we see David doing in his life? In his li oh, how many Psalms do we have? I don't know. There's a lot of, well, 150, but how many did David write in particular? And he wrote songs during times of victory, singing to the Lord. He wrote songs during times of defeat, singing unto the Lord. In the valleys and in the mountains and every place in between, he, he wrote psalms unto the Lord, singing unto the Lord, praising his name at all times in spite of the situation of the time in which he found himself. Well, that's how we ought to be. We ought to be those strong in the praise of the Lord. And, and the Bible tells us here that when Jesus comes back and establishes the house of David, uh, that all of Israel will, will be great people like un, uh, unto David in the service of God. And as you get into the millennial reign, now the sin nature will still be about, uh, but will not have the influence of Satan. And then as we get on in the age of ages, there'll be no more sin nature. And so uh, we see the attitude, I think, in this passage of scripture in particular as we go into the millennial reign that the house of Israel will be a great house like the house of David always was but the Lord says in this passage said but I'm going to establish the the house of David first not all Israel first. I'm going to establish the house of David first. And he's going to do that in the person of Jesus. For Jesus is going to hit the Mount of Olives with his feet. And that house will be established and people will flock unto him uh, for safety while he wins the battle. In particular, that battle of Armageddon. And so he's going to establish that house. And notice what it says here. The house of David uh, shall be as God. Now remember what the uh, uh, Paul said to the church at Philippi. He said in chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, he says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, God is the supreme being. There is none other like him. And the only way to be equal with God is to be God. And so Jesus uh, is equal with God because he is God. Now, uh, uh, keep defining this and uh, because it's misrepresented so many times. Uh, God is one in being, but he has three persons. Uh, nothing, nothing wrong with that. It might seem counterintuitive, but uh, nothing illogical about it at all, really. Uh, but to understand it, uh, how does that work? I, I, I don't know how that works because I'm not God. And if I knew how that worked, uh, then God wouldn't be uh, all that great because yeah, I'm really not all that great. In fact, everything that I know that's good and right, the Lord has told me. I haven't figured out anything for myself except he has revealed it through his word. Oh, how good his word is. And, and so the Lord says, uh, the house of David shall be as God as the angel of the Lord before them. Now, Zechariah has already referred to the angel of the Lord back in chapter 4. If you'll remember last week's lesson or last week's message, it was late coming out because of technical difficulties, but I'm sure every one of you watched it. Uh, <laughs> watch it in double speed. You'll watch it a lot faster. Anyway, uh, every... When you go back to chapter 4, you already see the angel of the Lord, and that is beyond a shadow of doubt, in my opinion, 
uh, referring to Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God and his work. And so when we get here to chapter 12, uh, the angel of the Lord before them, uh, I think it's easy to say, hey, this is the Messiah. Jesus, the son of God, is going to rule in the house of David. And so we see the uh, returning house of David will be returning with without a sin nature, without failures like David had, but with sinless perfection and ultimate wisdom like only God can have setting upon that throne of David. Now that's not to mention the angel who went before them, uh, the people of Israel as they traveled through the wilderness and meeting with uh, Joshua and the other several times that was obviously the Lord Jesus. Uh, but just looking even in Zechariah chapter 4, I think it's very plain that the angel of the Lord here is referring to the Lord Jesus in particular. So uh, what we find in this verse of scripture, Jesus is coming again. He's going to establish the house of David on the throne here physically on this earth. He's going to take over. And then the rest of Israel will be elevated just, just like David was. And especially, I believe we're looking at uh, the events going into the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus here on this earth. And so let's read verse, uh, uh, verse 9 and 10. Um, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications. They, uh, they will look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his uh, firstborn. And so as we uh, look at this verse, we see the grace and supplication of God. Now, what is the grace of God? Uh, well, it's the riches of God that are given. Uh, they are unmerited. And what does that mean? I, I knew that definition when I was younger. younger the unmerited favor of God. I didn't know what unmerited meant either. <laughs> so uh, as I grew, I learned. But it means to receive those good things which you don't deserve. And the Lord God is rich in grace and also rich in mercy. Uh, and he's going to uh, give to the people of Israel things that they don't deserve and supplications. Now, I think, the, I think this word supplication is very interesting in this passage of Scripture for uh, the word supplication means the intercession, the intercession of God. You see, we have Jesus who interceded for the people of Israel and for all the world on the cross of Calvary. He is the intercessor. He's the one who paid the sin debt wholly and completely and uh, now, I've just uh, been reading the book, The Mind of Christ by T.W. Hunt, and there's a chapter in there about the crucifixion of the Lord. Uh, wow. What a powerful description of what the Lord did for us. Of course, uh, he did much research from others as well. He very well notes, but uh, you can read all about it in the scriptures. But to ponder the things that Jesus went through uh, on the cross uh, of Calvary, on the way to the cross of Calvary, yet he was always in control. No one took his life, but he gave it. He gave his life. And on that cross, he cried, it is finished. The sin debt paid in full. Everything necessary was taken care of. And then he died. The wages of sin is death. He died, but then he conquered the death. He conquered the grave. He conquered the wages of sin and rose again the third day. And thereby he is our intercessor. He paid the sin debt, fulfilled the sin debt, conquered the grave, the prison of sin, if you will, and, uh, and in Jesus uh, we have that intercession, and that intercession, of course, is given to the people of Israel, and notice where this intercession is, and Zechariah uh, verse 10, and I, I love these pronoun changes, because the only way it could be is, is the doctrine of the Trinity that we uh, spoke about a little bit earlier, it says, and they shall look upon me, and this is the Lord speaking, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now, who was pierced on the cross? Jesus was pierced in his hands and his feet and in his side. He was pierced. 
they shall look upon uh, uh, me whom they have pierced, the Lord says, and they shall mourn for him. Now, you see the pronoun change from me to him. And the only way this can be fulfilled if Jesus is God, uh, but yet distinguished from the Father. And, and so, uh, one being three persons again. And so, so he says, they shall uh, mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness uh, for his firstborn. And so, uh, how is it we come to Christ in salvation? We should come to Christ in repentance of sin and faith in Lord Jesus Christ. But what is that repentance of sin? Well, that's when you come to that mourning because of your sin. Where you mourn because of uh, sin and the results of sin, the separation between us and the Lord and that, uh, that we're not righteous and no, no one can attain to the Father. We have all come short of his glory and, and this should cause us to mourn. Uh, now, when you think about mourning for our sin, uh, you might think about uh, the aspect only of, uh, well, I've sinned against God. Oh, I'm so very, very bad. Oh, this is terrible. That is part of it. But a, a big part of it is mourning because of the results of sin. Mankind had a relationship with, with God in the garden in Adam. Adam walked with the Lord and Eve walked with the Lord and talked with the Lord in the cool of the garden. And, and that should be part of our mourning. Not only that we have sinned and sinned against God, but that sin has, has separated us separated us from a holy, infinitely holy God. But yet, his supplications, his intercession, he sent Jesus to die on the cross and he was pierced uh, for our sins and pierced for the people of Israel as well. Uh, for it says they shall mourn for him and uh, mourn that uh, this sin that they have committed has uh, caused him. Uh, to take on that sin on the cross where he became sin for us, though he knew no sin. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3 through 6 says, And he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And this verse will resonate. The people of Israel know this verse very well. well they ought to know this verse very well. And it will resonate with them as the end of the tribulation period comes. And they see Jesus uh, descending and setting his feet on the Mount of Olives. And they shall realize... Oh, with, uh, with his stripes we are healed. With his uh, suffering we are healed. With his work we are forgiven. We thought he was smitten of God. But he was smitten because of our sins. And they shall mourn for him and they will, shall return uh, to him and call out to him. Uh, uh, he is the Savior. And so then we turn to chapter 14. In chapter 12, we looked at the uh, return of the house of David, and now we see the return of the Lord in the house of David. And in chapter 14, verses 1 through 9, verse 1 through 2, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, speaking to the people of Israel. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off uh, from the city. And during the tribulation period, uh, uh, Israel will be overran. The 
city of Jerusalem will be overran. Now there will be a covenant uh, that is confirmed by the Antichrist. That covenant may be in place right now uh, for all that we know, but the Antichrist will confirm uh, the covenant, whether it's in place now or not. He'll say that's a good covenant and he'll confirm that covenant for seven years. And halfway through that time, he will set in the temple and declare himself to be God and that he should be worshiped. And, and of course, this is the Antichrist. This is the beast. And, and whatever you look at as, as the beast, uh, uh, some see the beast as part of the governmental situation. I believe it's referring to a particular person who is ahead of the government of all the world, and uh, pretty much of uh, the ten league nation, and all the other world will, all the rest of the world will bow down to it. And uh, you'll not eat unless he says so. You'll not buy food unless he says so. Uh, you'll have to go through the black market and and those types of things. And and he'll establish himself as king and as God in the in the nation of Israel in Jerusalem in the temple, and the people will then realize. This is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. The Bible says they will flee and they'll be uh, helped. Here I believe we see that many will be ravished, but there will still be a remnant in the city. And I believe if you read chapter 13, the third of Israel, that's, you know, that's still not a majority, but that is encouraging. The third of Israel, the third of Jerusalem, in particular, I should say, will acknowledge Jesus is the Lord during this time. Well, that's the chapter we skipped over. Go read it for yourself and see uh, what your conclusions are. Uh, but, um, but verse 3 and verse 4, we see that even though uh, the, the enemies will come against Jerusalem, it's just God setting them up. He's bringing them there uh, to win the ultimate battle. In verse, uh, verse 3 and verse 4, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the, uh, the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst. It shall uh, really in the center, I think, will fall out in the middle of there and toward the east and toward the west and there shall be a great valley a very great valley and half of the mountain shall be removed toward the north and half of it towards the south and and so we see Jesus coming back he's going to set his feet on the mount of olives this prophesied here it will happen when the people of Israel realize that Jesus is the Messiah. They shall mourn for him whom they have pierced, and he shall set his feet on the Mount of Olives. And this is, uh, this is nothing unexpected, for even in, in the New Testament, this is prophesied in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. You remember Jesus gives the uh, last uh, recorded instance of the Great Commission. We find that in all four Gospels and in Acts, and I believe each one of them is a different uh, time that he gave it. Uh, but nevertheless, he gives the Great Commission in the book of Acts, and then he sends up to heaven. And all those folks around there are just looking up, gazing, wondering, and I would have been too. I, mean, I, I haven't seen any movies with people flying around. <laughs> Uh, at that time, and they didn't have those movies, and and so that would have been something quite extraordinary. Uh, but you know, I'd seen Jesus for three and a half years walk on water and do all sorts of things, so uh, they were still amazed with him. And then those two men there, I believe angels, said to uh, said to the men, "Said you men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up? This same Jesus is coming back, just like he left, and referring to his return, his second coming, when he puts his feet." on the Mount of Olives. He's coming again. Zechariah already prophesied it, and, and these uh, two men, these two angels, prophesied it as well. Jesus is coming back just like he left. And so, uh, so we see that this uh, really is not something new for those who have studied the New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament and New Testament agree. Of course, they're all the Word of God. The, the books of the Old and the books of the New Testaments. And so they must all agree together. And nevertheless, uh, <laughs> the Lord is coming back and he's going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. And in verse 5, 
It says, And ye, that is people of, of Jerusalem, ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. Uh, I believe verse 5 is a description of what's going on. Now this place, Azal, I'm told that uh, no one knows where it is, and the place might be a, a figurative place, a place of refuge. The word does mean, apparently, reserved. Uh, he has reserved. So, if you look at the word, what it, what it means, uh, because we don't know what of a place geographically, maybe it means a place of safekeeping, a place that's reserved in the Lord. And I think that could fit, um, you know, it's my thoughts. I think it could fit very well. For notice what it says here. It says that uh, the Lord God shall come and all the saints with you. Uh, and so I, I see here a picture of the safety that's there in Jesus when he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, that, that valley that's there. You can run to Jesus and you'll be safe and, and you'll not have to worry about all those who are trying to uh, overcome you for it is at this time that Jesus will fight, if you will, the battle of Armageddon. And of course we know from the book of Revelation he's coming with his saints. And uh, so this all seems to fit to me. Jesus is coming with his saints. And so the situation in verse 6 and 7 at this time, it says it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be as uh, one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And well, what time, uh, what is that like? Well, if you've ever been around uh, a cloudy night and the moon uh, shines through, and especially when snow's on the ground, it can be quite bright. Uh, I believe this is referring to the Lord taking the world and shaking it up. Uh, now in the, in the Battle of Armageddon, I believe it's chapter 3, it speaks about their flesh melting away and their eyes burning in their, in their eye sockets. And uh, if you've ever watched... Indiana Jones and uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the first movie, and not very accurate when it comes to those, those things of the Ark, but nevertheless, at the end of it, they open up the lid and, and their their face melts away, and, and what they did is they made a wax face and they melted it away to get that. Well, that's kind of the image that I have here, and uh, what I, I think we're seeing throughout the battle, uh, throughout the tribulation period is the Lord unleashing the violent acts of, of uh, creation, uh, volcanoes exploding, lava bursting forth, and of course the, the smoke and the and the ash and the soot covering the in the atmosphere and, and so it would cause a, it would cause light uh, to be refracted all the way around the world and so that in the middle of the night it'd still be light, but in the day it still wouldn't be bright. The sun wouldn't come through. And I, I think this is the culmination of what the Lord has been doing through the tribulation period coming to head with the Lord Jesus setting his feet on the Mount of Olives. And so I believe we see the setting there. And then in verse 8, we see the, the change, physical change in the landscape. Now he set his feet on the Mount of Olives, and it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea, and summer and in winter shall it be. Now Ezekiel speaks about this, a, a river flowing from the throne of God. And go to the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea, and, uh, it, and it will uh, bring life to all that region. And so this is something that the other prophets agree with as well. And I think you see that also in the in the new city, Jerusalem, a similar stream. Uh, but this will be during the millennial reign. And so, so the Lord, uh, when he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, will physically tear that city up in three parts, and out will come a spring of water. And uh, geologists seem to think that this fits. Uh, um, anyway, and then verse 9, and the Lord shall be king, 
It says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Now, we've been speaking a lot about the city of Jerusalem, but at, at this point, the Lord says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. At that day, there'll be no other, no other little G-gods. None. Only the one true God, if you will, the big G-god. Only one Lord. No one will serve himself. No one will uh, say, this is what I think God is like. But rather, they will say, Lord, what are you like? They will go to him. That's what it means by one name. One Lord and one name. There'll be no confusion about who is God. Will there be people that reject Jesus during the millennial reign? Book of Revelation bears out battle of Gog and Magog after the millennial reign. There'll be many who are born during that time. I don't believe any lost people will enter the reign, but they will have children. And many of those children, even though seeing the one true God, no questions about what is right and wrong concerning uh, uh, religion, as some would say, you can go to Jesus himself. But still yet, many will be lost. Why? Same reason why people are lost today. Because they refuse to humble themselves before the Almighty God and say, yes, I have sinned. I have done what's wrong. And, and throw yourself on the mercy of God. For he has paid for your mercy and the one who is pierced. Well, what all does this mean to us? Well, Jesus is coming again. There's no doubt about it. Now, I believe we'll see him come in the clouds first, and then after the rapture, I believe we'll have the tribulation period. I do have some dear brethren who uh, believe that uh, he'll come in the middle of the tribulation period, some the seventh trump, and uh, I think I have one good friend who might be, well, post-trib, maybe. Um, of course... I believe he's coming before, and so I believe that I'm right. Otherwise, I wouldn't believe that. Uh, but there is the rapture, and then the Lord is going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives after the tribulation period. Uh, some have speculated uh, that the rapture could occur, and there will be some time before the tribulation period begins. I would say that's, that's a good possibility. But the tribulation period will come to an end when Jesus sets his feet on the Mount of Olives. It'll be over. It'll be the last day, if you will, of the day of the Lord, which speaks of that particular age. Um, the age in which the tribulation period occurs and God sends Jacob's troubles to bring them back to him. And if the Lord's coming for Israel, he's coming for us too. If you should be a child of God and, and a Jewish person, oh, how blessed you are. And you might suffer a little bit more than others do because of it in this world, but you'll be rewarded greatly by the hand of Jesus. And for those of us who are not uh, Jewish by birth, but yet you know Jesus as your Savior. We are the children of Abraham by faith, and we have promises as well. And no matter what's going on in this world, mm, Jesus is coming again. And you might see the news of the day. I don't know what's going to happen between now and, and Sunday morning when this is supposed to come out. Uh, just no telling what's going to happen. It could be just horrible, horrible. Stock market could crash and uh, all sorts of other diseases. Just no telling what's going to happen. Um, and you might say at the time of listening to this, yeah, Jesus is coming back. But remember the Lord's long-suffering. And what we do in between now and the time Jesus comes back, we ought to go work. Because those who reject Jesus will suffer under his righteous hand of judgment. Preach the word. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is coming soon. And if you haven't trusted Jesus... 
that hear the word repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is coming soon. 